Greetings in the blessed holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you all for listening. This is going to be episode number four of the AIM webcast that we've been doing. And uh, I received a lot of feedback. Um, and Thank you for all that with the other ones that we have done. And I appreciate every all the emails and comments that people have sent in saying they appreciate listening to them. And Lord willing, we plan to do a lot of other ones in the future and many different topics. Uh, in this one here, we're going to be discussing Romans 13, but uh, before I before we start discussing that, I uh, just want to thank everybody for uh, all the support that uh, I've gotten on YouTube and BitChute um, this past year. I know on YouTube, uh, I was reviewing some of the, uh, the stats and everything with the channel, and um, we have received a lot of uh, views and a lot of subscriptions this past year. According to YouTube, um, at about 20,000 views on the channel and about uh, 4,400 watch time hours on the uh, on the channel, all the all the videos. Which the fact that uh, the majority of the videos are mine, I'm very humbled that uh, that people have taken that much time to listen to what I have to say. And I pray that the Lord has uh, taken what I had to say and uh, and and done good with it. But uh, I appreciate all the support, the subscriptions, the likes, the emails, and uh, everything that keeps those uh, those digital platforms going. It does help. And uh, on the line today, I have uh, Brother Paul with Tearing Down Idols. How are you doing, Brother Paul? Doing fantastic, sir. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And uh, I, uh, I know a lot of people enjoyed uh, listening to you on the uh, week before last, so we wanted to have you back on. And I wanted to encourage everybody that has not done it yet to go over to his YouTube channel, Tearing Down Idols. Uh, I'll put the link in the description of this video, this podcast, and go over there and subscribe. He's got some good videos that he's putting out, and I'm sure plenty more that he'll put out in the future. But in this uh, episode, we're going to talk about Romans 13, which is a... Uh, pretty controversial um, chapter among many people, uh, depending on how they interpret it. Uh, I know I've uh, I've read many books on Romans 13, and uh, I've listened to all kinds of interpretations on it. But it's a pretty important passage because if you interpret it uh, incorrectly, like many people do, it can lead you down a pretty uh, pretty dark road when it comes to just daily living and the dark times we live in today with the uh, with uh, the, quote, uh, leaders and rulers that are above us in high places, in quotation, and uh, how we perceive them and handle them and view them. And uh, I know, Brother Paul, I'm sure you have uh, have read a lot of different commentaries on Romans 13 as well, haven't you? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I've, I've read so many different viewpoints on that topic from so many different angles. Yes, it's, it is a, it's a popular topic, very common topic. It's kind of hard to avoid. It is, and I imagine it's probably, if it hasn't gotten more popular, probably will with all the different government mandates around the world and everything going on today. Um, a lot of Christians are wondering what to do. And uh, that's, that's actually a topic that I want to talk about more as these webcasts go on, is as Christians, what are we to do? What uh, what are what is our end goal? What is our, oh, it is our goal, period. A lot of Christians don't even have a goal. But uh, what are we supposed to be doing in society today? And um, it's a loaded question. I mean, it's a, it's a big loaded topic that we can look at very many different angles and aspects, and uh, it's something to discuss. But uh, for those that don't know, you know, you may not be familiar exactly with what we're talking about, Romans 13. And uh, I... Pretty safe. There's a lot of different interpretations, but it's pretty safe to say that the majority of the interpretations of the first half of Romans 13, and we'll read it here in a moment, is basically that Christians are to be subject and to obey and adhere the laws of the country and the government in which that they are around. Um, so if you're in America, if you live within the continental United States, you are to uh, obey the government of the United States no matter what they say um, because God has, quote, ordained them and they're, they're there. 
And they take this passage in Romans 13 and twist it to get that conclusion. Now, many Christians will sometimes say, yeah, it's to a point, though, you know, if it comes down to where they, you know, you're, you're to kiss the poppins ring and, uh, and deny Jesus, then you can disobey. But, you know, when it comes down to everything else, you know, we better, we better listen to the government and obey them in every aspect of life, um, you know, even if it's, you know, actually we saw a lot of it this past, uh, two years, you know, you had a lot of quote churches in the in the land uh, close their doors because the government told them to. Right. And uh, did they uh, did they do that a lot up there in Wisconsin as well, Paul? Yes, yes, it did happen quite a bit. Probably not as much as in other states because the vast majority of uh, sheriffs in the counties in Wisconsin said that they weren't going to enforce any kind of mandates of one kind or another. And so it was just a couple of different counties, um, Dane County where Madison is and Milwaukee County, which is no big surprise. Those are the two biggest metropolises in the the state. Um, They, they went full on full enforcement. So pretty much every church there closed their doors. But um, what was interesting was for me is watching the counties in Wisconsin where there was no enforcement going on, watching the churches that did close down, even when there wasn't any kind of enforcement happening. Um, They were, they were doing it not out of any kind of fear of repercussion, but simply because they were being told to do it. Mm -hmm. And that was a little, that, that was very concerning to me. They were perfectly free to stay open. Nobody told them to shut down except for the quote unquote experts. Um, and somebody that's pretty, wants to that's be, pretty telling of who their master is in that in that case. I mean, absolutely, that was exactly my thought. And so, uh, yeah, there were a lot of churches that did it when they didn't really have to. Yeah, and that's been a big. I mean, that whole that whole issue right there is just one small example. That's something that's happened recent that we, you know, most people can look at and see. Um, you know, I don't attend a uh, a fundamental church. Um, so I didn't experience any of that, but I know, I knew people that, um, that did, you know, some, some quote churches, they, they did online services. They shut the doors and, um, did all that stuff. And, uh, because they were, they were mandated and told, uh, that if they didn't, basically their doors would be shut. I know there was one fellow in Baton Rouge and I can't remember his name. I know he made the news. He, he refused to shut the doors, and I know he uh, uh, he went to jail, I think, twice. Uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, I can't remember his name, but uh, it was a pretty big deal when it was going on. And uh, it was, you know, the same song and hat. You know, they told him to shut the doors, and he said no, and he had service, and they came to him, and they hauled him off and put him in jail a couple times. I think it was twice. And... Uh, I think uh, up in Canada, too, there was a couple videos uh, going around at least about six months ago. Of uh, and Now, of course, Canada is worse than the United States is when it comes By to far. Uh, what, we're talk- what we're talking about. And uh, they uh, they were hauling uh, one uh, one preacher out of his house. They came and got him at his residence and said he had served. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we anyway, haven't seen so- anything that degree here. Not at all. No, we we haven't. And, uh, you know, without getting into the issue of churches and stuff like that, that that's an excellent example of how, um, you know, the government's telling you to do something, what are you to do? And uh, right. you know, a lot of Judeo-Christians would say they would quote verse 1 of Romans chapter 13 and says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And they would quote that, and it's kind of funny because that's usually the only verse they quote in the entire passage. <laughs> and, uh, and they, of course, they put the higher powers as being the government, you know, and for there being no power but of God, so the God or, or God has ordained them in their interpretation. So therefore, they uh, they say if you know if the government says hop, you better hop. You know if the government says sit, sit, and uh, 
there's probably, and I haven't done the research on it, maybe you have, on where that uh, that interpretation first came. I imagine it was probably around the 1500s, 1600s, uh, when that started to creep, creep in a little bit, because you had, uh, you know, the Church of England and some of the governments over in Europe uh, producing Bibles and commentaries. Uh, be interesting to find out where that actually originated from. Yeah, I haven't done any research on that myself, but I imagine that would be about the time it came into being, because that was about the time you had this whole doctrine of the divine right of kings becoming a thing. So, um, and we know that <clears throat> uh, King James I in particular, one of the main reasons why he wanted the authorized version uh, uh, created was because of the footnotes in the Geneva Bible, which conflicted with the doctrine of the divine right of kings. So very likely it was about that time period. I wouldn't be surprised. No, I, uh, I actually, I really enjoy the notes in the, the Geneva because it kind of gives you a history lesson on what was going on at the time. Indeed. Uh, because you read their, their commentary and, and, you know, for the most part, a lot of their commentary is really good. Um, uh, on many different passages, they are spot on. Um, I know I did a uh, did a message um, on uh, the seventy weeks of Daniel. I don't know about six seven months ago, and uh, and it's fulfillment at the cross, you know. And a lot of uh, fundamentalist futurists will, will throw it off into the future that last week. But uh, anyway, uh, one of the men at, uh, at the service. He, uh, he uses a Geneva Bible, and uh, he made a comment after my message that he was reading, you know, at the bottom of the footnotes, they have the, the commentary for those passages, and he showed me in the Bible, and uh, I hadn't paid attention in mind while I was preparing that message, the, the entire commentary on that passage is basically the, my notes of my sermon. Uh, they were spot on. They did not oh, have wow. a futurist um, uh, mindset of that passage at all. They uh, they were uh, understood it to be fulfilled in the first century with uh, at the cross, not thrown off into the future. Wow. That, it's great to have that second witness, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. And uh, so anyway, I know uh, somebody uh, speaking of the Geneva Bible, um, not to get off topic, uh, they uh, you can get the retypeset version. Uh, at least you used to, and uh, you oh, really? get them. And yeah, I, I have one, and I bought them for like thirty, thirty, forty dollars a couple of years ago. Uh, nice. So probably ten, ten years ago, but now they're unavailable. Uh, my brother-in-law, he went to buy one, and uh, he had to pay like one hundred and fifty dollars for a used one. And, oh my goodness! Uh, that was a cheap one, and uh, he had found them as high as three hundred. And uh, any other copy that you find is uh, the facsimile copy, you know, which is a little harder to read. Yeah, just so, a little uh, bit. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Yeah, you gotta uh, get real, uh, real uh, good on your old English in that that way. But anyway, um, in the uh, aspect of Romans 13, though, uh, Paul, in your research, what uh, what are some attributes that you think that are real important with that passage and and the view of it not being spoken, not being, not talking about secular government, but rather a biblical government. Well, I think there are two major points to consider when it comes to understanding Romans 13. And one is to remember that the chapter breaks were put in after, long after the letters were actually written. Um, so when we're reading these chapters, we have this tendency to stop at the end of chapter 12 start at the beginning of chapter 13 and see them as separate sections, almost as if they have, they, they're almost as if they're standalone. And that's a dangerous thing to do hermeneutically in any situation. Um, so when we're looking at chapter 12 and 13 and 14, what we're seeing in chapter 12 is the same thing that we see in 14, which is how we, how Christians deal with each other within the body. Mm -hmm. That is the context in which we find Romans 13 placed. Um, I don't care where you read in Romans 12 or 14, that is the topic. It's about Christians dealing with each other 
in the context of the body. And so for Paul to be talking about Christians dealing with each other in chapter 12, and then suddenly switch gears and say, oh, by the way, guys, submit to Caesar, and then go back in chapter 14 to start talking again about how we're to deal with each other. It's ludicrous. It's inconsistent. It's not how Paul would have written a a a letter with a coherent message. And so that is something to definitely keep in mind in that. And also one of the biggest issues that we find with interpreting Romans 13 is that in our King James Bibles in particular, where we find the word powers, that is the Greek word exousia. And exousia is better translated authority. If it were actually power, it would have been trans- it would have been the Greek word dinamos. And uh, when we find exousia, it is speaking of authority. And there's a big difference between an authority and a power. Um, drastic example: a rapist has power over his victim, but he does not have authority. So when we're reading in Romans 13, we're reading about those who are in authority over us. And in order to do that, and this is where a lot of Christians fall short in interpreting Romans 13, they need to go back and find scriptural precedents for what qualifies as an authority. And we nowhere find a king, especially throughout the uh, well, I don't care anywhere, really. Um, we don't find any place where a king is set up or spoken of by God as being an ultimate authority to whom his people should submit themselves. Um, they talk sometimes about God's anointed in the context of Saul or David, and we can get into that in another point. But the thing is, is we find God telling us to submit ourselves to those who are an authority to us over us in a natural context, such as elders or fathers and such like. Nowhere are we told that kings are to be submitted to without exception. And we find, in fact, we find plenty of places throughout Scripture where kings are defied, where kings are disobeyed, where kings are lied to even, um, in order to preserve what is good and right and just. So we need to see Romans 13 in context, not only in context with the book itself, but the context in the language it's written and the context of the Bible in general. And I think that's where a lot of Christians fall short. Yeah, I agree. And that that's an excellent point there. The, uh, you know, for God to have established, and I know the kingdom is, is a totally different, not a totally different subject, but for those that may not know, I've done some other messages on the kingdom, and we know that it was established during Jesus, the life of Jesus after the resurrection. And and it was there in existence during that time as well, so not just then, but it was he was in full power and authority during his life, and his, the kingdom was then and there. And why would God establish a kingdom for Christians? And then give them instructions to be trampled down under the foot of the evildoers. It flies um, in the it, face of the last verse of chapter 12. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How are you going to overcome if you're just going to be a doormat? Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 21. A uh, perfect example because there is no overcoming if you are just to comply um, right. and do do whatever they say. and. With the interpretation that many people take with Romans chapter 13, you know, be subject unto, you know, any, quote, higher power uh, or higher authority, and they throw that into the secular realm and and speaking of uh, governments and evil rulers, for that to be the case, then they also put the law of God into the hands of evildoers because they're saying basically you are to obey anyone no matter what they say. Right. And uh, that's right. an interesting, you know, so that, I mean, that, that means abortion, you know, if legalized abortion is all right in the eyes of, uh, you know, the United States of, 
uh, America, the government, then it should be in the all right in the eyes of every Christian because we are told to, you know, submit, obey, uh, be subject unto the higher powers is the way they right. interpret it. You were speaking of that word, uh, exousia. And uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, we have an example of exousia and uh, dunama- uh, dun- dunamis. I think, how do you pronounce that? Uh, dunamis. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dynamis. And it says here, this is the this is the New American Standard Version. Uh, Behold, I have given you authority, and that word authority there is exousias, to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power or dynamis of the enemy. Right. We have a verse there that uses both those wor- uh, words, but we can see that they're used in totally two different contexts. Yeah. And we can even use that to, you know, uh, as a commentary for Romans 13 to see how those words are are to be used. And for those out there that, you know, I, I use the King James a lot, and I use it a lot because mainly for the main reason is a lot of people use it, and uh, there's a lot of verses in there that people will read, and they, they need to be corrected in many cases because... Uh, the King James is not the best translation. And right. I know many people, I'm going to get some hate mail over that thing. <laughs> uh, Heretic. I, I had one fellow that sent me tons of hate mail for saying that I wasn't using the King James when I, I was using the King James in two of my messages. But in fact, I didn't quote any <laughs> any version at all other than King James, and I still got hate mail. But uh, It can't win. Yeah, I can't win. Uh, <laughs> I was very confused by that one. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, when we start looking at these words, there is better translations out there for some of these passages. Uh, not saying yeah. that using the King James, there's anything wrong with it, but uh, we do have to be students of the word. And uh, sometimes these old English words are not um, are not transmitted over to our modern English as well as we think they are. Uh, they meant totally, totally different things back in 1611. And, uh, right. Uh, we got. We have to do research and make sure we understanding what the passage is saying. And you have to also keep in mind who had the that particular version translated. When you're talking about the King James version, I'm not saying this is the case because we don't know his mind, and it wasn't mentioned in the um, to the best of my memory. It wasn't mentioned in the notes that King James gave to the translators, but. Um, when you have a king who commissions a translation, he's not only king of England, but also king of the Church of England, ruler yeah. of the Church of England, basically the Pope of England, um, and he commissions a Bible translation. Odds are he's going to see the value in putting down power in the place of authority in Romans 13. Indeed, and if he didn't, you know, maybe some of the, the people under his uh... – under his authority, that mm. was putting the translation together. Um, maybe their their views uh, were in favor of it. It's very possible. And I know I know for the word church, you know, uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, the word yep. ecclesia. Um, and I, I did a message about a month ago on that. And uh, the uh, the word church in the in the Bible. Now, although it's a it's a word that. We've used a lot, and it's hard to remove from our vocabulary, but the Greek word for church is the Greek word ekklesia, and it does not mean a four-walled church building. Right. And in, many, many, many Christians have failed that. And, that, and you know, that subject in itself is not unconnected from Romans 13 because the word oh. church in, it is a Christian community, is right. a Christian government, and we have been made to think that the church, the church, is a church building, uh, right. or maybe the, well, almost like a country club type thing. You know, somewhere that you go <laughs> once a week as a, you know, to visit and have fun, and you know, some kind of social interaction like tea time or you know, uh, a party. And. Right. Uh, you know, the uh, the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia, the people, you know, they can have service, you know, a, quote, church service. That doesn't make it 
the church, and uh, there's a lot yeah. of uh, misunderstandings with that. And uh, it, uh, we understand when we read the word church, it's not talking about uh, the church, but rather right. the church building, but rather the ecclesia, the called out ones. And, of course, the Church of England, they wanted that word there in the scriptures for the obvious reason that it made the people when they read the word church, to think, what church is it talking about? Well, right. either the Church of England or, the, you know, maybe the Roman Catholic Church, it made them think of the church. And I've even, right. I've even right. been around Protestant churches that uh, that thought, think that they are the only church. They're the remnant. They're the, they're the only one. Right. And every, everybody else is wrong, and when... They even come to that same conclusion a lot of times, you know. They uh, they get a kind of a listed up complex, and they think that they're the only ones in the remnant in the in the quote church. Right. Yeah. Uh, when when the average English reader read that Bible when it came out, and probably to this day, for a large extent. When they read the word church, especially in Romans 13, the first thing that probably came to their mind was the Anglican, which mm -hmm. was just fine as far as King James was concerned. And that's also why um, the Puritans, when they came over to America, specifically the pilgrims to begin with, when they came over, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, for the most part, they all carried – Geneva Bibles, because they wanted yeah. nothing to do with the state Bible. At that time, it would have been an equivalent to, say, oh, I don't know, Barack Obama or somebody going ahead and putting out his own translation. If he had tried to do something like that, the vast majority of self-styled conservatives would be burning his Bible in the streets. Um, that's a really good point. But that's how the... That's how the Puritans saw it at that time. They wanted nothing to do with it because it was a state-sanctioned Bible. And keep in mind that King James was the same guy who was locking up a lot of these Puritans in prison, making their lives absolutely miserable. He was the reason why the Puritans started coming over here in the first place, because of the way he was treating them. And uh, so they, they had a lot of stigma attached to the King James Bible, and they wanted nothing to do with it. So they brought the Geneva Bible over here overwhelmingly, you know, percentage-wise. And so when they came over here with that Geneva Bible, and they read Romans 13, they were not saying, reading it and understanding it to say that they had to be in submission to King James I. They would read it with a completely different mindset, and it was that mindset that ended up creating places like Plymouth Colony and others and turning them into absolute shining stars of growth and success and education within a few short years of their landing. Indeed. Yeah, they, they came over here with a goal of advancing the kingdom of God here on earth. Mm. They And they were fleeing secular government. I mean, exactly. they were separating themselves from secular government. Now, if the interpretation of Romans chapter 13 is that they were to submit, then they failed miserably. And, uh, yeah. they, uh, <laughs> and then if they had stayed in uh, England, uh, now, for those that don't know, they, they were being persecuted in England heavily. They were English. And right. uh, they went to Holland and for try to get some relief. And uh, things weren't bad in Holland compared to England, but their children had began to become Hollandized, and, you know, they didn't want to ruin their culture, and uh, they didn't want their children to grow up as, you know, Holland, uh, Holland people. And uh, so they packed up and moved to America to uh, do their own thing in the name of Jesus, not for riches and wealth, but uh, for their own, uh, for the glory of God. And I'm looking here at a... Uh, the Portsmouth, Rhode Island Compact here in 1638, uh, a quote from it. And this will kind of give you an idea. I quoted this in my sermon on, around Thanksgiving a couple of weeks ago. But uh, this will give you an idea of their mindset when they came over here. It says here, We whose names are underwritten by hereby solemnly in the presence of Jehovah incorporate ourselves into a body politic. And as he shall help, 
will submit our persons, lives, estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of his given in his holy word of truth, to be guided and judged by their, be judged thereby, excuse me, uh, give you an idea of their mindset uh, when it comes to secular, secular government. They fleed it, and they started their own biblical government. Yes, it's a completely different mindset from the Christians that we see today who will just kowtow to every little edict that comes down the pike. Um, it's, it was a world-building mindset, and that's, that is a huge difference. What the Puritans had was they wanted to build. They wanted to establish and create something founded on the Word of God, as we see in that charter that you just read to us. Um, a completely different mindset. Now, today, if a bunch of people decided to get together and found something, even if they styled themselves Christians, they would be more concerned with whether or not the government was okay with it. Well, we got to make sure it's legal. Um, and and where's that going to get them? That kind of mentality just makes society continue spiraling further down toward uh, the pits of hell, if you will. What we need is men like those Puritans who wrote that compact, men like those pilgrims who came over in 1620, men who carried those Geneva Bibles, men who understood that there was authority higher than any government, who understood that they should um, obey God rather than men, that there was another king, one Jesus, and operated accordingly. That's when things moved forward. That's when you saw real progress. Indeed, and, and, you know, America, the blessings that America received in those early years in the 1600s moving to the late 1700s, um, although they're fading quickly, those blessings are still can be seen today. And yes. uh, I, I know a lot of people think that, uh, you know, a lot of the blessings that we we remember in our memories in America are from, you know, the the 1800s onward, you know, because we're so righteous. And I disagree with that. In fact, you know, America as a country uh, did a lot of shady things after the, uh, the quote, war for independence. They sure and, did. Uh, they did. They did a lot of shady things, but they were still so blessed from the good that those early uh, American or those early Christian uh, founders in the 16 and early 1700s that put forth. And to, to give us an idea how big those blessings are, it's taken 200 years for them to start fading to the point where everybody's screaming, what, what's going on? What's happening? Correct. Correct. And what's, what's amazing, and this, this should be encouraging to all of us, and this is a little bit of a side note, but on that same vein, okay, so it took 250 years for them for these blessings to truly fade to the point where we know it's actually longer than that. If we're going to go back into the Puritan era, we're talking over, we're talking about 300 years or more. Yes, correct. Um, and it's taken that long for these things to, to fade. In fact, uh, I, I just realized that 2020 was a 400 year anniversary. Someone pointed it out actually. 2020 was a 400 year anniversary from the landing at Plymouth Rock. Oh, that's a good point. I did not know that. It, isn't that interesting? And now we're so what so if you compare what the what the pilgrims had in mind when they stepped onto that rock, a government of by and for God, and we look at what we have now, how far we have fallen, but like you said, it's taken this long for us to see those blessings fade as our faithfulness to God has faded. But what's encouraging is if we get our act together, and unfortunately it's going to take some massive judgment on a scale I don't think you or I are prepared to absorb, mm -hmm. but um, it can come back again. The, the rate at which those colonies grew and expanded into economic and educational and religious powerhouses – was absolutely stunning to the point that people were coming from around the world, such as Alexis de Tocqueville, coming over to see what the secret was, um, which is reminiscent of Deuteronomy 4. 
we can make that happen again, to have that come into being so quickly and take that long to fade. That should be a testimony to the generosity and kindness of our God, as well as his patience. Amen. And many of our people, and I know you know people as well in this aspect, they think that it is impossible and uh, to, to go back to where our pilgrim forefathers were. And I don't think that they realize how hard the pilgrims had it before they got here. And right. they have a whole lot worse than we have it now, and then here, and here we think it's impossible. Well, and, these uh, same people very likely would have said, well, it's, you see that little tub called the Mayflower? There's no way we're getting across the Atlantic in that thing. We're all going to die. Yeah, if you read the account, there were some people that were left behind, and it makes you wonder if some of them, if some of them stayed behind because uh, they didn't want to die at sea or whatever. I'm sure there were some negative Nellies in the bunch. Sure. And uh, sure. God obviously uh, uh, ordained the group, the specific group that came over for the, you know, for His His glory and His reason. But today, you know, we can have this again, but. The problem is, and one of the problems, is our people have become extremely lazy to advancing the kingdom. They have, and a lot of it goes back to four-walled Christianity, you know, keeping it within the four walls of the church. We've put advancing it outside of that, and we've let uh, the Antichrist forces take over all edges of society, everything. You know, there is not an industry that they have not planted their foot in. And even the churches. <laughs> no, we've we've gotten fat and lazy, and that was exactly the opening that they needed. Absolutely, and so, and we're going to talk about it more in some other episodes. But we, and what what we can do as Christians to encourage our brethren that you know we can have this again. This house of cards that we live in today, in the the, the government of America. You know, I don't think you can find anybody in America that doesn't think that it's going to fail one of these days and fall apart. And the thing that we need to work towards is when this mess that the country is in, when it finally falls apart, are we, is our children, our grandchildren, their children, are they going to have the resources, the knowledge necessary to rebuild America in a better Christian manner than it was when it set. And we need to make sure that, you know, that needs to be one of our main goals, making sure that we have the resources to do that. Uh, Right. As Hosea said, you know, we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And, oh, my goodness, that scripture is a loaded scripture because it uh, it, (laughs) – It's applicable, you very it, applicable. You can, you can look at it at so many different points of view, scripturally, uh, historically. Um, e- even today, um, you know, our people are dumbed down and stupid. It, it's, a, it's horrifying to think about. It is. So moving back to Romans 13, um, before we move on, I just want to read the few verses that me and Paul are talking about. We probably should have read these at the beginning. Uh, and, you know, we'll give some thoughts about them. Uh, reading in verse 1, and I'm reading now the King James, and uh, Paul, uh, I think you have a New American Standard there, don't you? Yes, sir. And uh, after we read it out of the King James, uh, we can highlight any any changes, because I know the New American Standard highlights some, uh, past some of these words a little better than the King James. But verse 1, it says here, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Wheresoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist it shall receive themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is, a, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, 
For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Verse 5. Wherefore, ye must need to be, excuse me, needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for the conscious sake. For this sake, excuse me, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. That was the end of verse 6. Um, and Paul, you can jump in at any time, but one thing I want to point out that's really, um, really bold in this passage is if this passage is speaking about the Joe Bidens and the Obamas, and the Donald Trumps and the you know the George Bushes of the land and their government. Verse three, it says here for the the rulers. Speaking of the rulers that we're speaking about in this passage, are not a terror to the good works, but to the evil. Right now, you would have to be an idiot to think that that a Joe Biden or an Obama or whoever it doesn't matter who. Uh, you can put whatever name you want on them, uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, Caesar, whatever, is a a terror to the evil. Right. And we, we don't see that today. I cannot say with a, a, a honest an honest opinion that uh, Joe Biden is a terror to the evil. Terror to evil right. works. It's actually the opposite. You cannot so that, expect evil men to be a terror to evil men. Absolutely. So that there should raise a red flag with anybody reading this passage and wondering, hey, what is it talking about? Well, right there, it should tell you that we're not talking about the evil governments of the world because they indeed are not a terror to evil. Absolutely not. No, we cannot put every single ruler under the umbrella of of that verse and unfortunately people unthinkingly do exactly that and you know what's funny is people will will say those things about governments today say oh yeah we just have to submit to government everything they they say and i've asked that question okay so if you happen to live in germany during the late 1930s early 1940s would you have submitted to every ordinance of government and they would say oh no heck no no that not not even not even, no no question there. Okay, so obviously you have standards. <laughs> yeah. So where, so where do you draw where that line? Where's the line at? <laughs> yes, that's the question. We need to draw a line somewhere. And be consistent. We need to be consistent in our hermeneutics, and that is one thing that most people are not. You know, if if there is a line, we need to know where the line is. And uh, right. You know, and I've heard many people use the analogy you just said about Germany because it usually gets everybody's attention when you start talking about, you know, Germany during World War II. And, yeah, uh, the of big course, bad they, guy. Oh, yeah, they, you know, they draw a big line in the sand when you say, start talking about that. So uh, right. they, they draw a line there, but, you know, we can move that same equation over to, to Russia during Stalin, during the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, where over 20 million Christians were murdered you know, mm. during that time, were they, you know, were they to be subject, you know, to the authority, as many people state, and right. um, give up their Christianity for the state religion of atheism? You know, during the Bolshevik Revolution, there was 20 million Christians killed between, I think it's 1919 and 1990, if I'm not mistaken. It was awful. 20 million. And uh, I know I read one report. It talked about 40,000 of them were just clergymen, preachers. Man. And they would take, they would take uh, teachers and Sunday school teachers and anyone that would uh, dare teach children of the, the gospel or anything about Jesus, and they would ram pencils in their ears and gouge out their eyes. Uh, they do that to the teachers and the children. And you know, are we to think that they, we're to be subject to to that just because the uh, you know of the, the misunderstanding in this passage that uh, 
so many false preachers push out in the land today? Of course not. That's ridiculous. God would never want us to be subject to those things uh, and not be able to fight back or resist. In right. fact, like you said, it would uh, it would be contrary to verse 21 in the previous chapter of 12, where it says, uh, "Be not overcomer, uh, be not overcomer of evil, but overcome evil with good." Right. Exactly. You know. Well, you know, it's it, with with Christians today. It's okay. Yeah, uh, the apostle said we ought to obey, obey God rather than men, but they like to throw in the disclaimer to a point. <laughs> yeah. You know, just well, we ought to obey God rather than men, but to a point. If men, if men starts re- men start really threatening us with maybe freezing our bank accounts or throwing us in jail or taking one or five hundred one c three status or whatever it is, then suddenly we comply. Exactly. When the heat goes up, uh, then then I'll comply, and that's kind of how it is today. And we're we're naive to think the enemy doesn't hadn't caught on to that. Uh, uh, that mentality of thinking. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you read in you read about the uh, the Reformation and how hard the the Christians were treated during that time. They were being burned alive. They were being tortured. And uh, you know, we think we have it bad now, but uh, we don't have it anything close to the way they had it. But it, you know, we're not far off from getting that bad. I mean, it, it doesn't we really take long. You know, no, you, were talking about, you were talking about how quickly the blessings of God came upon the uh, America and the pilgrims by coming here and advancing the kingdom of God and doing the, uh, the well, being righteous and, and obtaining the promises that are promised when we are righteous and obey God. The, uh, the same the, uh, for the opposite. When we are terribly, terribly bad, wicked, terrible the curses of god come on to us just as quick and sometimes yeah. much quicker yeah that is true that is true and we're and we're seeing that today with you know all the the scientific experiments you know to the season my speech with salt uh, going on and the uh, the, <laughs> the mandates with those scientific experiments and people being right. uh, forced to take them or they Actually, they're not even being forced yet. They're being pressured into taking them at this point. Uh, the forcing is coming. Uh, it, it's coming, uh, and I know in some other some other countries it's already gotten there. But um, right, the uh, we haven't got there yet. Now they don't really have to do it yet because most people are just being pressured into it. Right. No, we we need to understand a distinct difference. The distinct difference between a government that is established by God as opposed to a government established by men. Now, does God allow these governments to exist, these evil governments to exist? Yes, he does. He allowed Babylon and Assyria and Egypt to exist, for example, but that was so that they would be a scourge to his people and get them back in line. But notice that down the road, they had their day. Eventually... They, they they got what they had coming. And so we can understand from that that they were not established by God as something that God approved of as his representative. And that's what Romans 13 is talking about here uh, when you get down to places like verses 3 and 4. It's his minister for good. His minister for good. Now, I don't think that anybody would go so far as to say that, say, Pharaoh was God's minister for good when he was mandating that the Hebrew midwives throw all the male Hebrew babies into the Nile. He was not God's minister for good. And not only that, but the Hebrew midwives noticed that, according to a lot of fundamentalists, they were committing a double sin. Not only were they not bowing to Pharaoh— um, submitting to the powers, but they're also lying. And by, according to the typical Romans 13er, in our fundamentalist interpretation of that passage, they were sinning. But we find in verse 20 of Exodus 1, it says God was good to the midwives 
And in verse 21, it says that because they feared God, he established households for them. He blessed them because of that. that should, why would he do that? that? Beg, beg your pardon? I said, why would he do that if, it, if they were sinners? Exactly. Precise. They were just They were rebels. Yeah. <laughs> These were awful sinners, and boy, any good law-abiding Israelite would have run to Pharaoh and ratted them out. They unfortunately would have. Yes, unfortunately. Um, one of the things that I point out to people when we're talking about Romans 13 as well is Hosea 8, uh, chapter, uh, chap, yeah, Hosea, yeah, Hosea 8, um, and we could probably start at the beginning of the chapter, but for the sake of brevity, we could start at verse 3. It says, Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. He has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, my anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? Okay, so what, what is he talking about? He's equating idolatry with the setting up of kings that he does not approve of. So not all kings, not all princes, not all rulers and so-called authorities, not all powers, does he approve of. We can't just take a blanket statement and say that these rulers are there as ministers of God for good when kings and princes can be set up apart from God's approval and be equated with idols. Indeed. And, you know, <laughs> that's an excellent point. You know, just like he used, you know, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Romans to basically act as his weapon, his form of punishment for Israel, the same is for the rulers today. But that does that Amen. mean that we are to bow down to them and participate in their idolatry? Uh, our idolatry is what has put us into, I guess you could say, slavery or into right. the situation of bondage that we, we are we're in today. And we can right. look around today, we could talk a couple hours on this, but talk about all the idols that we have in America today. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, I, and I don't know if it, this is the worst that it's ever been, but I would say that it probably has been, because today we have not just Idols of wood, gold, and silver. We have, uh, we have, well, we have wood. It's called, uh, it's called money. Uh, <laughs> we don't, uh, we don't take a tree and, and cut it down in the woods and make a totem pole and, and bow down and worship it and sacrifice our young to it. No, we are a little bit more sophisticated in it. We take it, we'll take it to a paper mill, we'll turn it into pulp, and we'll turn it into these green little pieces of paper, and we will sacrifice everything in obtaining this this idol. And right. uh, we even print people's faces on it, you know, um, <laughs> it's just like the old totem poles of old. And uh, and I'm not saying not to use Federal Reserve notes. It's all about how you perceive it in your heart. Uh, right. You know, I, I don't worship Federal Reserve notes. Um the uh, same thing can be said to the person that uses silver or gold or whatever. Uh, you can be uh, you can be exchanging anything. It's it's whether or not you are participating in the sin of idolatry. But today in America, we'll take and we've been taught from a young age we will sacrifice everything: our children, our livelihood, uh, our home, or whatever for the, quote, our careers and obtaining a good income. And not saying that that stuff isn't necessary, but we will, how many people do you know out there that have only had one, zero children or one children, one child, because of their career or how they can't right. afford them because they have this they're trying to pay off. And, of course, we know from the 50s onwards, they've went from, you know, the man being the breadwinner to now, you know, in most households, the man and woman have to go out and participate in this scheme that they have made. Right. And, uh, 
Then if you move past money, you have, you know, everything from ball players to television to uh, uh, politicians, oh, politicians, actors. I mean, yeah. And, yeah, uh, the it, ball it's endless. It's it, the list of gods that we have currently is absolutely endless. It could be all sorts of things. And of course, now in, in today's era, our idols now are the medical establishment. Uh, you know, don't you dare question the high priest. Don't that you dare very question. Well, maybe the, one of the biggest idols. In yeah, the currently. Because you know, they. Uh, that's a that's an interesting. Uh, Interesting point because you know the, the medical establishment, and we've all been very familiar with the medical establishment the last two years because they've been in the highlight, the spotlight. But uh, they have their their preachers, they have mm-hmm. their priests, they even wear robes. Yep. They have the authority to get you out of work. They have the authority to lock you up. They have the authority to do practically anything a king can do. Correct. Uh, in fact, you know, the medical establishment has more authority than uh, more authority than uh, the president of the United States, if you think about it, because uh, they can they can even shut him down medically if they want to. <laughs> it happened really suddenly, didn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 quite incredible. You know, I've said this many times. You know, if you want to look at well, government and religion. There's really, at best, a very fine, very blurred line between the two. Government is religion and vice versa. And just to really break it down into simplistic terms. Okay, so you have their priests. Mm -hmm. um, You have their taxes or their tithe. You have their prayers, which can be votes or petitions. You have their music, which you know their hymns, which would be anthems and such such like. You have their um, uh, their churches, which would which you would see as their government buildings. They are sacred; only certain people are allowed in them, just like the Holy of Holies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you you have a, a wide variety of parallels between government and religion we just put different names on them so when we look at these governments that we set up these rulers that we set up contrary to god with the princes and rulers that he did not recognize and we end up paying tribute to them what we are doing is doing exactly what we read in Hosea 8. We are committing idolatry. Remember what God told Samuel when the Israelites wanted a king. God told Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. They want a king like the nations all around them. They don't want me to be king. They want one that they can see, that they can touch, that they can handle they want one who is among them. I was just talking about this with my kids not too long ago today. Which is arrogant? To submit yourself to the one true God or to submit yourself to one who is technically your peer, one who is a fellow human. Mm-hmm. When you're submitting yourself to a fellow human, you are saying that this man who is just the same as you, as human as you, is more worthy of your your uh, tribute, of your worship, than God himself, the one who made both of you. That is not only arrogant toward yourself, but it's a slap in God's face. So when we're reading Romans 13, we need to keep this in mind because we could end up taking this chapter, turning it on its head, and and using it to justify some awful idolatrous practices, which unfortunately, as you pointed out, have become the very fabric of our society today that needs to come to an end if we hope for a chance at surviving the coming judgment, which unfortunately, I'm not so sure there is a chance anymore. I think that judgment is well on its way, if not here. 
But oh, there's def- there's definitely going to be judgment. Uh, what yes. it's going to look like, we have no idea. Oh my goodness, I don't think we even want to think about it. But the bottom line is, you and me, we need to make that commitment to focus on doing things in accordance with His will and not theirs. So I think, bottom line, when it comes to government, I think what we need to do is is ask ourselves a question. What is that government which is ordained of God? Um, what does that look like? Who are the rulers in that government? Well, if it's talking about godly government, which it obviously is, Right. Because it's talking about in, in verse 4, for he is the minister, speaking of the the higher authority or the, the one ordained to God, is too good for thee. So we're ta- obviously talking about godly government, and which is interesting because it, uh, it flies in the face of the, quote, separation between church and state. We <laughs> often yep. hear about. Uh, and there's no, no coincidence that that, uh, that has happened. So, yes, good question. What is a godly government? And remember years ago I did uh, Bill Strittmetter. He's passed away now. He did a uh, had a Bible. It was called the Bible Law Course. It was a uh, correspondence course. It had eight, eight, eight parts. And uh, Sheldon Emery used to promote it, and then Pastor Peters promoted it after that. And um, in that... Uh, in the course, it was all about uh, you know God's law and whatnot. But anyway, in that course, there was a a uh, illustration that he had, and it was a picture of a Bible, and uh, it was the uh, forget the percentage. I think it was eighty five percent person uh, government and fifteen percent personal. And it was speaking of the Bible. When you read the Bible, it's about eighty five percent pertaining to governmental bodies or uh, body politics or the kingdoms, not personal attributes, right. personal instructions. It's uh, on, a, on a nation, and much like the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, they had national instructions that they were to follow. And for us to say that that doesn't exist today, we, we throw out most of the Bible. Uh, right. And we forfeit quote, government of today for evildoers only. Right. Saying basically that, you know, Christians don't have a dominion mandate at all to take dominion. They just, you know, leave that to the Antichrist. Uh, God just wants us to build churches. (laughs) And uh, we have seen how that experiment has taken place. We have more churches now than ever, and we have more uh, idolatry and more sin than ever. Exactly. Yeah, so we need what we need to do is uh, see that we we goofed up somewhere, go back to square one. And the 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 thing about what that government looks like, we can debate all day as to what exactly that is, but oh, yeah. we need to go back to the foundations of it. The foundation is first and foremost the Word of God, His law, His commandments, and Jesus Christ as King ultimate king Amen. and authority. So when we go down from there, we find ourselves looking at what is the natural, original, governmental body that God ever established for the kingdom. And we can logically conclude that any antichrist government would be going after the foundation of that government, that very building block, tooth and nail, trying to destroy it. So when we go back to the beginning, and I mean way back to the beginning, when God first established man, first created Adam and Eve and put them up, put them in the garden, what was the very foundational building block of kingdom and government as God saw in his perfect world? And we find that it is family, husband, Amen. wife, children, living in accordance with God's law. And what do we see under attack in today's era? We see the family under attack under so many different directions. I couldn't even begin to list them all. But what we see is the vast majority of families fragmented, 
fathers who don't know how to be fathers, mothers who don't know how to be mothers, and children who have absolutely no inclination, desire, or even education toward obeying and honoring their fathers. And so when we are honoring our fathers, when we're honoring our mothers, when our children and the parents are all working together as a cohesive unit, we see the beginnings of kingdom. That is the seed of kingdom, I like to say, because that's where it all begins. And that is what is under attack by our enemies. Honor your father and your mother, I believe, is distinctly uh, tied to Romans 13. Because what I, I can't think of an authority that has been more obviously naturally ordained than our fathers. Amen. Um, and what have we been encouraged to disdain in our current era? What's the big thing now? Okay, boomer. That's the that's the expression of disdain for the previous generation that's come before us. Um, yeah, you, and you hear that all the time now. You do. It makes me sick. I hate it with a passion. And it's not, and it's not a compliment for those that don't, that don't know what we're talking about. It, it is used in a tone that is uh, it's uh, a insult. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, you know, and, what, today, and what do we see? It comes from a generation that is probably popular with more reprobates than the previous, if that's even possible. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, this generation, the, you know, the 2022 generation, um, they do not have a love for their fathers and their mothers. And, right. uh, yet, yes, a lot of it, you know, I know a lot of people around my age, and, you know, I can list numerous uh, people, and, and I'm talking about Christian people, uh, but I can list numerous people, and they all have mother, mama, and daddy issues. And they all have their reasons why they have mama and daddy issues. And it, it, it amazes me when I, I listen to some of the reasons why they have an issue with their mom and dad about whatever reason. And they want to whine and complain. And I've known, I've known other people that had real cause to have mama and daddy issues. I'm I'm talking serious mama and daddy issues. All right. Uh, and them have a love and respect for their parents, uh, mama and daddy, that these people today, these children today, don't have for their parents over something as stupid as, well, they didn't buy me a car, or they, they didn't <laughs> do this, or they didn't do that, or... Uh, I can't even think of any good excuses right now that they use. But anyway, um, but it it is something of an epidemic, I guess you could say, of this disdain towards the mothers and fathers for whatever reason. Exactly. And, uh, what we don't realize when we do that, though, is we are showing examples to our children. Right. When they see us do that, when they see you act that way, and one fellow told me one time, uh, actually, I, I spoke to the man but one time in a, uh, in a message I was listening to him preach. He, he made the point that the, the battle that we're all in here in America, the, the one that we're, we're fighting to reclaim America, that it does not start in the courthouse. It does not start in the in the Capitol and out on the, you know, protesting or whatever field you want to put in. But it starts at the breakfast table. Absolutely. In the morning with your children and how you raise them. And today our the generation is not raising their children. In fact, yeah. you know, then you, ha then you have the whole public school issue. Um, and, I would, I would think the majority of the people listening to this broadcast probably probably homeschool their children or were homeschooled. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, uh, some may not. But uh, today, when, when we send our children to public school, we are basically forfeiting them over and having someone else mold them into what they want them to be. And we're so surprised when they're 20 years old or younger 
and we wake up one morning, and they're nothing like what we are, right. nothing like their parents. And we very stupidly um, wonder, what, what happened? How in the world did my child turn into hellion? And it's basically as we forfeited them or sacrificed them um, for for idols. Basically, it's no different than Moloch worship in in, in a way. Um, Truly, because we've sacrificed our children to the public school system, the government-run school system, for quote our careers and everything like that. And I've often asked people, um, "Would you let the government manage your finances for you?" <laughs> and I have never found somebody who said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. That Yes, I would definitely let the government manage my finances. Then I'll ask them, would you let the government teach and mold your children for the rest of their rest of their life? And to that way, the government has control into what kind of person that they're going to be. And uh, you kind of get a dead, a dead blank stare at that point because uh, – <laughs> They wouldn't. They wouldn't give the government control over their Federal Reserve notes, but they will give their children, their offspring, control over the same people. Uh, give them. Right. Give them over to the, the same people. That's a that's a frightening thing when when they're <laughs> they are more willing to hand their children over than hand their money over. That is absolutely atrocious and sickening. But unfortunately, that is Baal worship. It's Moloch worship. I mean, that's what people did. They would sacrifice their children on the altar of Moloch so that they could have a better harvest or whatever it is that they happen to be sacrificing for. It's the ultimate expression of self-centeredness to the point it's so self-centered that you are actually destroying yourself because you're destroying your progeny. Indeed. It's beyond and, insane. And for the, anyone listening that, you know, they they may not know what I'm talking about when it comes to homeschooling and public schools. They may be just listening to this for the first time. Uh, don't get offended by what I, what I say, but listen and think about what I'm saying. Uh, and if you send your kids to your public school for whatever reason, I know everybody has different reasons for what they do in that aspect, um, I would please consider changing um, and – yeah, you know, you may have to make sacrifice in order to uh, to raise and teach your children in that way. But uh, let me tell you, it's worth every every penny, everything that you can sacrifice. Uh, because every, at the end of yeah. the day, or more more better said, at the end of your life, what what is more important, riches or your children? Oh my goodness! So, so for those that are don't know what I'm talking about, just please consider if you do have your children in public schools, just Consider um, what you could do by homeschooling them and uh, or getting a family member that you trust to help you with it, whatever whatever it takes. I, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to do it, to mold right. that child into the way that you want them to be, not the way the government wants Exactly. And if you're trying to engender a kingdom mindset, not only in yourself and in your children, um, doing it without the state – involved in that aspect at least of your family rearing is essential because you are taking control of what is an essential building block of the kingdom and you are shaping it in accordance with his will as opposed to the state's will see this you see your children are building blocks of something Okay, they're either going to be building blocks for Christ's kingdom or they're going to be building blocks for the state. You have to make that choice. And the only way your children are going to be building blocks for the kingdom is if you take them out of the state's molding factories and put them in your own home where you can shape them in the nurture and admonition of God. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sending my children to public school so they can be a, a light, so they can be salt and light. That is a cop-out because your children, first of all, are not old enough to be salt and light in, a, in a, uh, an establishment that is designed to squash the salt and light out of them. You're, you're sending them into the lion's den. You're sending lambs 
to be salt and light in the lion's den. You are not doing your children or anybody else any favors by sending them to public school. Um, and I, again, you know, like, like Matthew said, this is not to offend anybody, but this is vitally important for your children's future, for your family's existence, and for the existence of the kingdom. God gave you those children so you can do something with them for the kingdom and to hand them over to Caesar, to take what God gave you, the most precious thing that you could possibly receive from God and hand them over to Caesar is completely counterproductive. We have to make that choice. Amen. And and it's not always easy with the world we live in. Uh, No. You know, and they've made it that way. Um, And they've had many different vessels in order to uh, get us into a point where we were not able to do that. Uh, Death's one of them. uh, Right. It's difficult. It is. It's difficult. And uh, death's one of them. Uh, How they block us into certain avenues, it's difficult. And there's going to be sacrifices, but it is your children we're talking about. And uh, it's worth everything that we can give. And like Paul was saying, the, the kingdom here on earth, we can go and debate and argue and try to convert our brethren down the street at the Baptist church or, you know, at, at a bar or wherever you find the people that you, you try to uh, try to convert. And that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. We need to do that. But mm-hmm. we don't need to forget our children while we're trying to evangelize our brethren because our children are is our best evangelical opportunities we'll ever have. And yes. We, we have a captive audience that actually cares, especially when they're at least when they're young, and listening to you, they care what you say, they care what you think, and you have a blank slate to do what you want to with them, and God's given them to you to put that impression upon them. And when we give them right. to the public run, uh, the government run school system, we, we we sacrifice that, and it's it's so terrible. So, uh, and like you said, it's the, it's the building block of the kingdom. It is our future. And uh, it's no mistake that they are encouraging people not to have children. And right. for the children that they do have, send them to them to be trained. Exactly. So, yeah, in light of Romans 13 on all that, we when we understand the difference between uh, heavenly ordained government and the government that is not of God, it suddenly starts to become clear. I would also like to make a note, too, just as a side note, and I don't want to take too much time with this, but the word minister that we find in in Romans 13, in verses uh, 4 and 5 in particular, that, that word is translated from the Greek word daikonos, which is the exact same word that we find the word deacon translated from in such places as first timothy and titus it's in reference to a servant in its exact same word now are we going to be consistent in our translation here are we going to say oh it just means a minister a government minister here but over here in first timothy say it just refers to some guy who passes the plate every sunday I mean, what are we going? What is what does that mean? Especially when we understand the difference between church and ecclesia, which I know you've gone over in a previous message, Matthew. So I won't get into that. But Christians need to get out of this four-walled Christianity mindset and start understanding what ecclesia really means. And that is a governmental term. It refers to Christian government. It refers. It's a kingdom word. And so these ministers in a kingdom, in an ecclesia, these are people who minister for good. And by the way, that minister in verse 4 is what? An avenger who brings wrath on one who practices evil. Now in verse 19 of the previous chapter, it says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So, 
who is wreaking this vengeance. According to verse uh, 4 of 13, it is the minister, the dikonos of God, who avenges the, uh, the righteous, who avenges and brings wrath on the one who practices evil. How do you make these two verses harmonize? I'm telling you, the little twerp who passes the collection plate every Sunday at the local church down the road from me is not going to be avenging any evil. No. <laughs> there, there's, more, there's more to those positions uh, mentioned in uh, Timothy and Titus than people, uh, people understand. The word oh, there's and, so much. An elder and bishop, they, those are not just terms to be thrown around. Uh, they oh. are positioned in a, in a governmental sense, a, a, a kingdom governmental sense. And uh, like Paul was saying, the uh, the government we're talking about here in Romans 13 is the ecclesia Christian government, the body of Christ, the not secular, secular government. And within that government, just like in secular governments, there is position. There is governmental mm-hmm. position. There's work that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, today, when you when you limit it to a deacon passing an offering plate and a, a bishop just preaching a sermon once a week, you right. are totally mocking the entire system. And uh, when we read, in, especially in the Book of Acts, but you, in, through the entire New Testament, we read about the uh, the word church or ecclesia. And I, I encourage you to do a word study. Go to blueletterbible.com or something like that and type in the word church and, uh, and do a word study on the Greek word ekklesia, which is the form, and go through every verse in the New Testament that that word is used and try to read that verse that it's in with the idea of the modern-day four-walled Christianity definition of church building or maybe mm-hmm. even, you know, people that go... And if you read that verse, you will find out that it never fits into the way that we think about it today. Uh, but Absolutely. rather, the apostles were going to these different regions, and they were setting up, quote, ecclesia, churches, uh, bodies of believers in those areas, and they were governing each other. They were go- It was a Christian government, um, right. and they were going and setting them up. And that's what we need to do today. But and Paul and I have talked about this before, the family is where it starts at. Uh, going out and trying to get recruits in that area, that uh, needs to be organic and, uh, and coming alive. And uh, the children and the family is where it starts. And uh, I think, Paul, you had made a point uh, in, in a private conversation one time about the uh, – the, uh, requirements to be a, an elder, a deacon, and a bishop, they're centered around family attributes. I mean, you need to be a man yep. of one wife to be a bishop, and you have to have your children in control. Um, why is that? Well, you cannot govern a body of people within within the ecclesia if your children are unruly. Right. And uh, same thing with any thing to do with the order in the home. You need to make sure that your home is in order. Uh, for one, you be an example to the other people within the ecclesia, and two, you know what you're doing. You're not a novice, right. which is another requirement, right. not to be a novice. Right. Yeah, that, that's always kind of made me laugh. You know, the the Mormons have these 18-year-old, quote-unquote, elders riding <laughs> around on their little bicycles. <laughs> yeah, I can't even grow them. Can't even grow a mustache, let alone. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, it it's all family based. It is all family based. You know, if we could we could go on for hours about about what the government of God is, and quite frankly, I don't have it all figured out. I, you know, if somebody neither do I. If somebody ever does figure it all out, please let me know. Um, I, you know, the, the fact is, you know, it's not that it's it's not that it's not there. It's just that we have fallen away from it so far and so hard uh, within such a short period of time. It's it's actually quite appalling. But 
if we want to get to it, I am absolutely convinced, if we want to figure out what it's all about, we need to start with the foundation of Christ and family and how family is supposed to operate. So the fifth commandment is a great place to start. Uh, you know, husbands, love your wives. Wives, uh, obey your husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Those are the foundational aspects of Christian government. It begins first in the heart, then it expands to the home, and then expands to everything outside the home. Um, it, it, it's an inside-out type thing. Unless you've got yourself in submission and your family in submission, you will never, ever, ever be able to establish anything outside those parameters. It will all fall apart and you're going to make a fool out of yourself. God will expand as you establish yourself in those primary areas. Um, you know, and I look at a lot of these people who are in a rush to go ahead and make ecclesia. Um, most of these people who are in a rush to form ecclesia, that I know personally anyway, I'm not saying it's the case for all of them, but a lot of these people who are gung-ho and ready to do it tomorrow, their families are a complete disaster. Yeah. So why are they so eager to make this happen when, in fact, they aren't qualified to be leaders in it? They aren't qualified to even head up the formation of it. They need to sit back and perhaps encourage those who are qualified Um and do everything they can to get themselves back to where they're supposed to be, because quite frankly, if, you're, if your family is in shambles, that says something about you personally. Um, we need to start humbling ourselves and going back to square one with this whole thing. If we're serious about this, anything worth building is going to take time. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not. And these people who want to make it overnight don't understand this. We need to start with self. If we want to build the kingdom, it has to start with self. And we work, and that is very closely connected to how things are operated under the home. It has to be done in accordance with God's commandments. That is where it all the begins. That, the way this works is exactly what you're saying. The way this works is with yourself, and then after you get yourself in order, you expand it to you know to your, your spouse you know, or your wife, the children. Okay, now you have your family in order. Right. Then you branch out to your ecclesia, your community, the body of Christ in your area. After you get that in order, then you can branch out to your local community, your state, your country, the world. Right. And now a lot of people don't want to hear that. They they no. don't want to hear from the bottom up. They want to hear from the top down. It sounds like work, Matthew. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I know, a lot of work. You know, my wife's not really into it right now, and uh, the kids, you know. <laughs> but we need to understand, and I know everybody listening to this will probably agree with me, this did not happen. The, the, the case of our, our country, you know, how bad it is, it did not happen from the top down. It happened from the bottom up. They, they started it in the public schools. They removed prayer. They brought in antichrist leaders. They they started with the uh, teaching our children nonsense, and before you know it, the children are adults, and then their children. They it gets a little worse each generation. Right. And next thing you know, they're running the country three generations in, and much like the illustration that about the frog that you put into water. And, right. Uh, for those that don't know. If you take a boiling pot of water and you throw a frog in it, uh, I've never tried it, but this is what I've been told. <laughs> you throw a frog in it, it will uh, it, it will it will jump out. And uh, but if you put the frog in a cold pot of water and you slowly bring the temperature up, before you know it, he's cooked alive and he didn't even know it. But because it was gradual. He, he never noticed until he was dead. And uh, I'm originally from eastern Kentucky, so I'm sure one of my relatives, I could ask them, they, 
<laughs> frog legs. I could ask him about that. Uh, but uh, it's like that way here in America. It has been a gradual thing over time. And right. uh, there's a lot of damage control. Uh, but uh, a lot of people out there, they want to go, you know, take on Washington and take on, you know, the government and that aspect. Or, and that means different things to different people. But we need to understand it starts with ourselves, our family, and then it branches out from there. That is exactly how the, we got in this mess, and that's exactly right. how we're going to get out of it. And uh, it, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lifetime of work. You know, yes. kingdom, advancing the kingdom in, in the here and now, in your lifetime, is a lifetime, a lifetime at work. And uh, there's a reason we're called ambassadors in the scriptures. And if you look up that word ambassador, it's a very government term. It's not what we consider a, quote, church term. It, you're, you're an ambassador to a government body, and that government being the kingdom of God. And we need to treat it that way. And we know, nobody's perfect. We all have issues. Me and Paul are not perfect. and no, we, Neither of us think we have it all figured out. But... We both can agree that we need to advance the kingdom with Amen. one little time that we're here, and uh, in whatever way we can. And uh, anyone listening out there, we're all supposed to be different: arms, legs, eyes, ears to this to the body of Christ, the ecclesia. And we all have different skills, different jobs that we can do. And the laborers are few right now, and the work is plenty. And uh, here in America, I've talked about it a couple of times, and uh, Paul has too. We have an awakening going on right now. There's things happening within our people that are uh, different than the last 20 and 30 years. Now, granted, there's a lot of bad out there too. Uh, yes. But I've talked to people that uh, are – waking up to things that they wouldn't have been woken up to two years ago. And they're talking about things that uh, are totally new to them, and uh, you would have never caught them dead talking about things that they're talking about now. That's very good, and uh, I've heard different reports from different people. We definitely have a lot going on right now that's uh, very yeah. positive. Yes. Uh, hang on just a second here. I'm sorry. No, go right ahead. Uh, I got, I've got a, a child situation I got to deal with. I will be right back. No problem. But no, uh, with the with the state of our country today, we need to understand that us as Christians, we need to be very labor intensive on the gifts and the jobs that God has given us. Well, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of labor out there, and we need to be advancing that kingdom in every way. And it starts with the family. And it moves out, and after we have our family in order, we can move out to our community and our ecclesia. And there's many ways to do that. Uh, Lord willing, in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to have another program on witnessing to people and different attributes of doing that and uh, how we witness to people. And that is what happens after we have our homes in order and we can branch out to our ecclesiastical body. We can start witnessing to our brethren, doing Bible studies, giving tracts, books, doing whatever we can. Um, maybe you're called to preach. We need more preachers today. We need more people taking up the mantle to teach uh, this truth yes. because, quite frankly, we have an abundance of, quote, preachers and teachers in the country, but they're teaching nonsense. Right. And uh, so we need more people. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people don't want to take up that mantle but uh, it, it's uh, it's something that needs to be done, and uh, I know a lot of capable men that are out there, very knowledgeable men that uh, could do it. Uh, they just, uh, you know, at this point, they uh, they haven't, and uh, that right. is, uh, that's where we are right now. And the key thing to this teaching thing too, and and it's it's one that is all too often overlooked, is you need to be able to have that testimony in your life besides the words that you put out there. Um, the greatest testimony that you have is the one that you can offer from under your own roof and in your own life. And when we 
fail to have that, we're nothing but hypocrites. I mean, let's face it. I mean, we've seen just extreme examples. I mean, you had the the, the big guys like the uh, Jimmy Bakers and the others back in the day. Um, and it continues. I mean, Joel Osteen seems like he has one scandal after another. Um, yeah. What we need to have is that that testimony in our own lives. And so when, when we're talking about preaching, I mean, yeah, not all of us are called to do that. Um, it's great to have teachers, but not of a, all of us are called to do that. And that's fine. But one thing we can all do to teach and preach is to just show people what we have. It's that whole Deuteronomy four aspect of evangelism. When we give that example and people come to us and say, man, what's your secret? How did you do it? Um, and that that is the kind of testimony you want because then you're not hunting people down. You're not running people down and, and trying to share to it with them. They're running to you, and that means you have an audience that is already primed and ready to go. They want to hear what you've got to say. You should be excited about that, but we need to create that environment and make it happen. We as Christians need to live by example. And um, yes, when we have our house in order, the people that our loved ones, the ones that are around us the most, when they see that, you know, they're going to do, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to come running to you, thinking how and they will ask you how in the world are you doing this, or they're going to observe you right. under a microscope and, and and learn from you. Now that may be intimidating to some of you, but that that is a very <laughs> good thing. Uh, yeah. That you want people to look at you and examine you. You want your life to be where they can examine you and look at you. And, and learn from what you've been able to to grow into, and and look at your children and do the same. Right. And uh, then we have improvement in the community. And uh, yeah, preaching and teaching isn't always just standing in front of somebody. It's actually living, living like Christians. Absolutely. Uh, supposed to. And that's the best preaching and teaching you can do is living by example. Oh yes, and it's something we can all do. Every one of us, yeah. We're, in fact, we're all called to do that. That is not a uh, not something that uh, just a few of us have to do. We all are called to do that. Yeah, that 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 is uh, without exception something we're all supposed to be doing. And that is harder than preaching any sermon. <laughs> you, can, uh, <laughs> you, you know, I, I can yeah. preach a thousand sermons, and that is a whole lot. Uh, li- living the living the life that you preach is harder than anything that we can do, and that's but we're all called to do that. By far. By far, but that's how we are ambassadors for this kingdom. We're trying to promote, um, and you know, and think about think about this just in terms of the examples. Okay, so we are trying to set the examples as ambassadors for the kingdom of Christ. Compare that. Compare the the goal of what we're supposed to be presenting to what examples we're getting from the current governments that we are living under today. What examples are they giving us? They're giving us examples of wastefulness, examples of uh, murder and theft and um, lies and suffering, unhappiness, fear, um, discontent, reprobate minds. Um, that we we certainly should not be running to that system and asking, man, what's your secret? How are you doing it? Um, In fact, I just saw a comic panel not too long ago. Uh, Zombie apocalypse breaks out in Washington, D.C. The the, um, ends briefly for lack, um, well, how'd it go? Zombies all starve because of starvation or something. Like a brain. (laughs) Yeah, they they all die of starvation or something like that. Yeah, no brain. So, um, it, it was, but that that's the kind of reputation they have. You ask anybody, I don't care who it is, the vast majority of people are going to tell you that, man, these people are a bunch of idiots. Um, yeah, even, it, even the liberal uh, non-conservatives understand that. They may not uh, be conservative, but they understand that most people in Washington are idiots. Right. And, of course, my question to both sides of that aisle is, and you're still voting for them? But that's beside yeah. the point. Um 
the the point is that the example that we should be setting should far outshine. And these days, it should be the easiest thing in the world to outshine the example given to us by the system that we're living in today. We should be able to show people this and have people see the difference and notice that there's something different. Amen. Well, I know I know we only scratched the surface on this topic. I knew we weren't going to get uh, you know real in depth in it because it is such a a big topic. And uh, it is. You know, it's it's actually you know the the subject. What we've been discussing is, is the kingdom of God. Is what we're, we're been discussing this entire evening. Uh, everything that we're, we're we've discussed is all pertaining to the kingdom of God, God's ecclesia, and that is one of the biggest subjects in Scripture. And, yes. Uh, it's uh, it's also uh, one that you know is very needed today. I mean, we we need to be studying this topic in detail, and uh, we'll just look around. Turn well, I'm not going to say turn the you know news on, but uh, just look around the world today, and, and that will tell you why it's so important. So, uh, before we wrap it up, Paul, do you have anything else we want to close with? And uh, we'll uh, well. Uh, I guess uh, short and sweet. Um, people are all into slogans these days. Um, you know, they they all want their things to chant and and put on bumper stickers and T-shirts. We need a new slogan. Um, well, it's not all that new, but we need to readopt this slogan and make it spread. And that's no king but Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that is an old, an old one. That uh, that that one became popular at least in America during the uh, 16, 1700s. But if we read yes. in Acts chapter seventeen, right, that is what the uproar was. That is how the Christians <laughs> during the first century were quote turning the world upside down. I'm going to read that passage here. Uh, Acts chapter seventeen, verse five says here, but the Judeans which believed not moved with envy, and took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, and gathered a company, set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers, unto the rulers of the city, crying, mm-hmm. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Amen. And we read that scripture there. That scripture there is what the, the, what the early Christians were doing in this passage and, and all through the first century, second, and third century. What they were doing was not the modern Judeo-Christian interpretation of Romans 13. They they were not submitting. They were crying, no king but King Jesus. He's the only king. Caesar's a fraud. We're obeying God rather than men, and they meant it. They meant it. They weren't just doing word service. And these people here, and one thing many people forget, they were preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was turning the world upside down. They were crying, no king but King Jesus. They were crying that Caesar is not king, but there's another one, King Jesus. And that turned the world upside down. We need to ask ourselves as Christians, each and every one of us, this isn't just a blanket statement, me, me included, are we in our life? turning the world upside down? And are we turning, and of course that world, the evil world, and what that means is where, you know, if Christians are on the bottom and the evil are up on top, and we turn the world upside down, the Christians are on top again. And we need to ask ourselves, are we doing that? And uh, for those that don't know, Jesus is kingdom, kingdom of God. It's here and now, here on this earth established and Jesus is king we're not waiting for him me and Paul don't believe that we're not we don't believe Jesus is going to be king like many teach but uh, rather we believe he is king right now in the here and now
Are you there, Paul? I don't think I lost you. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap this uh, this podcast up. I oh, I'm sorry. Everybody. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I accidentally clicked mute somehow. I apologize. No problem. I thought I may have lost you in the, in the, my rant there. But uh, <laughs> no, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. I appreciate everybody listening. And uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll have another one next week. I'm not 100% sure on the topic next week. I need to sit down and figure that out. But uh, I, uh, we will definitely be addressing this subject again. There's a lot more that we can talk about with this. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, keep uh, we could we could continue doing these for the rest of our life and still have plenty to talk about. But Paul, thank you sure. for uh, coming on. And why don't you close us in prayer tonight? And uh, we uh, enjoy talking to you this evening. Oh, thanks for having me on. It was an honor. Uh, Father, we're we're grateful to you for this time together to discuss your word and your kingdom and to have this conversation, and we pray that it would be an inspiration and a help to others. Pray that someone will glean something from this, and it might encourage them to look further into matters regarding uh, your kingdom and how it pertains to them now and today in a current modern context. We ask also that you will encourage all of us to do the things we ought to do in order to move forward and to advance and make progress in building the kingdom and making it uh, the bring it into the the full the, the new Jerusalem that you uh, have in mind for us. Thank you for your Son and for the sacrifice that He has sacrificed on our behalf that makes all this possible. Amen. And we pray that as these days continue and as the net of our enemy seems to close in, we ask that you will um, give us the strength and the courage, the zeal to continue to do what we ought to do, no matter what the cost, no matter what the obstacle, to trust in you and the strength that is in you rather than any weakness that is in us. We thank you again for this time together, and we pray for many, many more to come. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one more thing I want to mention before we get off is if uh, you're looking for a good commentary on the Ro- Book of Romans, uh, Pastor Ted Wyland wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago called uh, Roman, uh, The Romans 13 Template for Biblical Dominion. Real mm. good uh, Real good. Uh, commentary on the first couple verses there and uh, go into a lot of detail and I'll uh, I'll leave a link where you can read it for free online in the description below or better yet order you a hard copy and uh, if you want to read more into uh, Romans 13 and a, and a good biblical commentary on it it's a good book well you have a good night Paul and thank you for joining us and we'll have you on soon thank you for having me on sir I had a great time my have pleasure night. Y'all have a good night, and we'll be uh, we'll be back next weekend, Lord willing. Good night. Good night.